Stanford University. Welcome to the seminar on people, computers, and design. Terry Winograd, and um, glad to have you all here. Um, next week, we have Deborah Tater from uh, Virginia Tech. We'll be talking about micro-coordination. She's been doing work in uh, computer-supported cooperative work and uh, collaboration for, for many years. And, um, that will be next week. This week, I'll just move right along. We have uh, Céline uh, Latulipe uh, from the University of North Carolina. That's what UNC stands for here. Uh, and um, I really am looking forward to the talk and pleased to have her here because over the years, we've had a lot of talks that range from here's some pure technology stuff to here's some social studies and so on. And from time to time, we get somebody who's really looking at this intersection between technology and art. Uh, and I think a lot of the creative, not just creative in the sense that the artists are creative, but creative juice for our field, for coming up with new kinds of interactions, comes when you make those kinds of connections, you have those interactions. Uh, so she's been working with dancers and artists. Uh, she did work earlier on two-handed interaction, uh, which is a start towards getting out. So a lot of you were here a couple weeks ago, heard Johnny Lee talk about new interface technologies. And it was sort of a nice lead-in, because in some sense he was saying, here's all the technologies that let you do something more than sit at a desk and type things or punch on a little phone. Uh, and Celine is really looking at what is it you can do with those? How do you manage to uh, enhance creativity uh, for people who use new interfaces? Welcome. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, is this volume okay? Okay, good. All right, so um, uh, as Terry said, I'm from UNC, but specifically UNC Charlotte. There is that, there's that UNC envy. I'm not actually at Chapel Hill. I'm at one of the others. Um, so, and I've been at UNC Charlotte for about six years uh, after coming from doing my PhD at Waterloo. Now, before I get started to talk about evaluating creativity, which is going to be sort of a large portion of my content, I do want to dive in and show you some interesting interaction techniques. And I'm actually going to start by um, running a little app here, and I'm going to need everybody to be silent for about 10 seconds. Not that you're making a lot of noise at the moment, but shh. Okay, now you can make noise. <laughs> Okay, so this is a little app that was developed um, in concert with an undergrad student that I was working with. He was a very oral student. He ma made a lot of noise. He whistled constantly and annoyed everybody. And he decided he was going to draw with his whistling. So he started creating this app. Um, and I can actually draw with this. So, um, and it follows your mouse cursor as you move around. Um, but it responds to your, your volume and your pitch and so on. Um, since he did that, I took the code then and started just modifying it in various different ways. And right now I have a touch screen on the wall in my kitchen in Charlotte that has a version of this code. And my father in Canada has a touch screen on the wall in his kitchen. And I see his sound dots and he sees my sound dots. Uh, and this means that when I come down in the morning, I can see some dots on the screen. I know that my dad has gotten up. Things are, are, are normal. Um, and that's great because my dad lives alone. So I'm applying this to sort of that um, supporting aging in place type of thing. Um, other, other ways that I'm thinking about using this is to actually compare sound dynamics um, in different rooms and see if I, can, if I can actually get a visual difference in playing the same music in one room versus another and seeing what happens. Um, it's also an interesting actual speaker's uh, tool. So. Right now, I think, you know, I'm getting a fairly good range of sound, but I've actually had this running in a seminar where a speaker was completely monotonous, and the screen was a sea of red until someone sneezed, and then there was this explosion of beautiful color. Um, so there's, there's a lot of interesting things you can do with this. So I am going to actually just minimize this. I'm going to let it run in the background while we talk. Remind me at the end of the talk, we'll go back and we'll see what a sound rendering of this session looks like. So now we'll jump back in. Okay, so 
Um, as Terry said, I started early on doing work in two-handed interaction. I was really fascinated by the idea that we use our two hands every day in real life, lots of interesting ways. But when we get to a computer, at least back then, all you could do was type. That was the only two-handed interaction you could really do. If you plug two mice into a computer, they fight over your system cursor. And this is actually still true today, which is pretty pathetic considering that we're all starting to use two-handed interaction with iPads and iPhones and all these other devices. If you go back to your desktop computer and plug into USB mice, they will still fight over one system cursor. You still only get one spatial stream of input. So I will give a little tiny demo to show you the kinds of things that you can do with two-handed interaction. Um, these are two standard USB mice. I mean, they're kind of fancy looking, but they're just regular old USB mice. And once you get them on the right side, um, they give me two separate spatial streams of input, and I can do things like draw shapes. So I can position and size an oval. Um, I can select that oval and then position, size, um, and rotate it all at the same time. Um, and probably one of the most interesting things that you can do is actually draw and edit splines with two hands. So I am oops, I'm going to draw a spline, and this is a single-handed thing. I'm right-handed, so I did it with my right hand. But now I'm going to select a point on this spline. I get a tangent at that point. My cursors warp to that. And now I can do this really interesting, very fluid spline manipulation that is way faster than any kind of regular spline manipulation with one hand, where you have to sort of separately change the tangent, drag the point, um, all these sort of serialized operations. So that's the kind of thing that I did early on. And then people said, OK. We give you that you can do geometric manipulation with two hands, but you're never going to be able to do anything else interesting with two hands. And I said, no, I took that as a challenge. And I went back and I started working with images and photos. Now, the minute I say I'm going to do two-handed photo manipulation, you probably assume that I'm going to rotate photos and flip them across a table. But what I'm actually talking about is two-handed pixel-level manipulation of imagery. So. I am going to make this the right size so I can see it all. Load an image. Oops, wrong mouse. You see, I have three cursors. Because in order to get this to work, I have to go do this low-level hack at the hid level and grab these mice in exclusive mode so they no longer control the system cursor. So my touchpad controls the system cursor. And I'll grab this image, because this is my favorite example. Um, this interface is not well scaled at this resolution, but you get to see two-handed curve manipulation. So if you've ever used Adobe Photoshop's curves tool, this is my version with two mice and two cursor, and I'm applying a nonlinear transformation to the tones in the image. So when I do this type of thing, I'm highlighting the mid-tones. I do this type of thing, I'm making the mid-tones darker. I can decrease contrast, increase contrast. But the point is, is that the interaction is intuitive and easy. Um, it's flexible and expressive. And I can explore really fast what the different possible curves are that can impact this image. Um, another device is this tone zone tool where I can move this rectangle around. And what this rectangle is doing is actually the Adobe Photoshop levels tool, where you have four different little sliders. So if you look at this rectangle, if you look across to the side, that's the minimum and maximum output tones that I'm manipulating by moving that. And the bottom is the minimum and maximum input tone. So I'm manipulating all four of those parameters simultaneously by playing with this rectangle. Um, and it's also sort of a spatial memory cue. I can say, well, I really think that the image looks best when I've got the rectangle there. but I'm going to go check it out and see. Maybe I want to invert the image. Maybe I want to do this. No, I really think it was best the way it was. I can remember, oh, the rectangle was up there. That's where the image looked best. So there's a lot of interesting sort of built-in implicit history, expressiveness that are in these types of, of uh, techniques. The Ken Burns effect is something that was added a little bit more recently. So here I can say, I want to create a movie out of this image starting on that bridge going over to the landscape, scooting down to these figures, um, then focusing on this one figure. And then I'm going to pan out and see the whole scene. And I play this. And within five seconds, I was able to create a narrative 
um, movie from this single image. And it's because of those two hands. I didn't have to switch between panning and zooming to specify those frames of interest. I could do it all at once. Now, I gave this to some of my artist colleagues, and they're using this tool to make movies of their static images, which are displayed in galleries. My one artist colleague, Annabelle, she said, well, this is really great, Celine, but she loved the tone zone tool, the levels, because she could make things appear and disappear. She said, I want to apply that tone zone interpolation while my, my videos are playing. Um, and so I went away and did some more coding. Um, so I'm going to show you what that looks like. I'm going to grab this particular frame with the, the one figure. And then um, I'm going to switch to my tone zone. And I think I'm going to photo invert it so that I get, yeah, there. That looks like a good, crazy ghosting effect. And now I'm going to play it. And you'll see the same narrative, but now we're going to get that sort of interpolation. Um, as we zoom in on this one figure, we'll get this ghosting effect, you know, sort of very expressive and evocative. Um, so these are the types of tools that um, I've been creating. All right, so back to the presentation. All right. And then um, the, the big thing that's happened since I got to UNC Charlotte was that I started working with dancers. The way that this emerged was I took my two-handed drawing tool and I decided to make it collaborative. I made it so you could plug in four or six mice and you could get you know, eight or, or 12 cursors on a single screen. And I thought, well, this is great because now artists can collaboratively work together on the same canvas. And I created this interaction technique where artists together could draw um, a complex polygon. So if I had eight cursors, if I had four artists, each with two mice, controlling two cursors, I had eight cursors on screen, they together could control an eight vertices polygon. And I thought this was fabulous. I thought, they're going to love this. And I brought artists in, and I let them try it. And they did find it really cool and interesting. Um, but they didn't know when to stop. They had no real desire to actually jointly draw complex polygons. They thought it was an interesting interaction, but it wasn't something they needed. When they were drawing, and this thing was flying around, I called it flying origami, they were like, this is fascinating. And they wanted to just keep moving their mice. They didn't actually want to stop and draw the polygon anywhere. So I had done what is considered a sin in HCI research. I had created a solution that had no problem. Um, so I had to figure out what to do with this. And we have a new media group on campus. So this is where the power of interdisciplinary communication really comes in. I went to this new media group and I said, hey, I made this thing and I think it's kind of interesting and cool, but I don't quite know what to do with it. And the person who became my colleague there, who's a choreographer, she was in the room and she said, can you strap those mice to my dancer's ankles? And I sort of thought, sure, but let's try with wireless mice. <laughs> um, now, of course, doing this with wireless mice actually isn't really going to work because wireless mice need to work on a surface. Right? So we actually sort of thought about, well, we, maybe we could have dancers you know, caressing each other with mice to get that kind of movement. But that seemed a little odd. And then we found that you could actually get these gyroscopic mice that are like TV remote controls. They just work in midair. And so we immediately created this pilot dance using this technology. Um, and then that led into further work. So we actually then got funding from the NSF and started what was called this Dance Draw Project. So this image up here, that's actually a picture of that flying origami. That crazy triangular type thing is a six vertice polygon that is being controlled by those three dancers who are each dancing holding two mice. Um, this picture over here is actually from our most recent production. So we did a big production in the fall. This dance is called Heavy Recursion. Um, so since this time, we've moved on and tried various sensing technologies. Our object was, how can we sense dancers in a way that we can get real-time interactive visualizations so that, in some sense, the dancers are being artists and drawing as they move? Um, in this case, we've actually moved to using just a single overhead camera and tracking. Uh, and I'll show you a little video of this piece. This is just an excerpt. So we're doing some vision to detect these taped down rectangles that the dancers actually tape as part of the dance. And when they go into them, we're sensing that. Um, 
and capturing some images. The, you also might notice the sound dots. This is me taking that sound painter stuff and throwing it in here so that we actually have some visuals that are responding also to the music. And in addition to the sounds the dancers make as they lay out tape or other sounds they make with their body. Um, by the time we got to this dance, my dance colleagues were really becoming influenced by our heavy use of technology. And so they actually built into the dance these ideas of restart and crashing. And so whenever this restart symbol showed up on screen, the dancers would fall to the floor. Um, they were really exploring thematically in the dance our dependence on technology. Um, but in a second now, we'll see actually some of the sort of the tracking as, they, as multiple dancers come in, um, which ends up being really beautiful. One of the issues that we've had in this project is figuring out how to make sure we achieve a balance between people visually watching the dancers and watching the, the projected visuals. Um, and these visuals are very strong. These projected visuals, they grab your attention actually away from the bodies on stage to some extent. But the dancers in this case said they loved it because their bodies are up on the projection anyways. So they're being watched and they're being watched from a different perspective which allows them to express themselves in a different way. Right. So one of the things that we're working on now is because the visuals in this dance were so particularly strong, we've taken them and created a piece of artwork. Um, we call it an epiphenomenal artwork because it was created as a byproduct. And that's become an art video in its own right. Without, so you can watch that without ever actually seeing the dancers' bodies. Um, but you are seeing them in the visuals. So it's, uh, it's quite interesting how that happened. OK. Um, Another aspect of the technology that came about through this Dance Draw project is a web-based application we created called the Choreographer's Notebook. And that came about because we'd go into dance studio rehearsals, and the first half hour in the studio was often spent by dancers and choreographers sitting around in a circle on the floor, talking about what needed to change in the rehearsal based on what happened in the last rehearsal. Um, and we thought, well, this is really important communication. But it's weird because they're doing it in this dance studio, which has this sprung floor, ballet bars, mirrored walls, all this special technology that's meant for movement. And they're sitting around like at a boardroom table. Uh, and so we thought, well, let's take this important communication and move it out of the dance studio, put it online. And that would allow then more time in the dance studio for actual movement and dancing. That was the goal. So, we created this video web-based app where rehearsal videos are uploaded and the choreographer can go in and put in comments temporally sequenced along the video. They can sketch on the video frames and the dancers can then go in and get their corrections and embody those corrections before they go to the next rehearsal. The dancers can also comment, but they typically don't. Um, it, that's kind of a, an interesting thing. While they might comment on each other in rehearsal, there's so much nuance in the way they voice those comments and there's particular social dynamics that, that doesn't, they, don't, they don't feel comfortable translating that into the online world, at least not with the level of commenting that we've given them at this point. We're working on video and audio commenting and maybe at that point dancers might feel comfortable because they can soften and say, well, I don't know, but I just kind of think that you might want to try this, which is the way that dancers talk to each other, whereas the choreographer will say, do this. It needs to be like this. So there's, there's very different uh, ways of communicating. And we're working on figuring out how to support those. So I just rushed through and talked about 100 different interaction techniques. Well, not really, but a whole bunch. The point of showing you all that is to see, for you to see that a lot of the interaction technique development that's, that's going on in the world today that's really interesting is not about productivity. It's not about rushing through and getting something done in a speci spe specific amount of time or preventing errors. Um, in the arts and in supporting creativity in general, you want to allow people to get immersed, to spend a lot of time. And you want to allow them to work with mistakes. Because what we've noticed in working with artists is that when th someone says, oh, well, here's a mistake, they often say, no, but that's an opportunity. This, that, that could work really well. Let's try this. Um, 
So we can't measure these types of techniques in the same way that we've traditionally measured things in human-computer interaction. We can't count task time, and we can't count errors. So we need to come up with some new ways to deal with this. Um, so that's sort of my overall current research goal, is how do we figure out how to evaluate whether some system or tool or technique is really supporting an individual or a group in some kind of collaborative or creative task. Um, so the way that I'm working on this right now is uh, sort of a two-pronged approach. We've created a survey metric that is a standardized survey that can be used to compare different creativity support tools that support the same task. Um, and then I'm most recently working with uh, biometric physiological sensors. So I'll talk about both of these. So the Creativity Support Index is our survey tool. And this is hopefully meant to become a standardized survey tool, similar to the NASA TLX. How many people here are familiar with the NASA TLX? <laughs> Scott and Jeff, OK. So it's a, it's a standardized survey tool that was developed by NASA for sort of more ergonomics, figuring out how well a system or a tool supports some very specific productivity tasks for well-defined tasks. It's a nice survey because everybody knows about it, and you can use it to compare different tools and get those comparative results. So we liked the structure of it for the most part, and we wanted to replicate it. So we went through this whole human-centered psychometrics approach, long time developing this. And I'll actually I'll show you what the survey looks like, just to give you a sense of that. So this is uh, one of the screens from the survey. So you have these, uh, these statements like, what I, was, what I was able to produce was worth the effort I had to exert to produce it. And you can say whether you agree with that or not. The system or tool allowed me to be very expressive. I became so absorbed in the activity that I forgot about the system or tool I was using. So this is the same kind of format as the NASA TLX, but the questions are very much about supporting creativity, immersion, exploration, that kind of thing. Um, and the interesting structural aspect of this is that, followed by those statements, they then have to do these 15 comparisons. And what these comparisons are about are figuring out which of these types of factors are actually most relevant to the task they're doing. Because it's not necessarily the case that composing piano music um, is going to have all the same kinds of important aspects to it that, say, sketching is. And so we want this to be flexible. So they would have to ask, say whether ex exploration was more important than working with other people. right? And so there's going to be a whole bunch of these types of comparisons, whether exploration is more important than actual enjoyment. So you can see you go through a bunch of these. This allows the statements to be then weighted. And what you end up with in the end is a number out of 100. And the higher the number, the more the tool or system supports creativity. So if you can compare two systems, you can start to see um, which one is actually supporting the creativity the most. Now, you can get categorical results here. So comparing these two tools, exploration was higher in one than the other. Yeah? So I don't know the full history on how the NASA TLX came about. But my understanding is that at least in part is based on an existing body of theory. Mm -hmm. that's so like, for example, notions of you know, working memory and cognitive load and all these right. things that and physical then provide, capabilities. Right, then provide you know, a, a basis from which to do that. And so this seems very interesting. I'm wondering, is there a similar or analogous body of theory that you're building on to Yes. To arrive at these questions. Yeah, so the initial starting point was a huge survey of all the literature on what people think about creativity. Now, that's a little bit more nebulous probably than the literature on human factors, which is much more precise. So we, we did sort of a comparative analysis. And you know, um, there's a table in our paper that shows how things, things like flow came up in multiple different papers. They were called different things, but it was the same kind of concept. So you know. We want to obviously make sure we're supporting something along the like along those lines. So that became our immersion factor. Um, yeah. I, I had, I bet, the reaction that a, a lot of people had in having hearing this survey, which is one half of me thinks this is brilliant and a giant advance in terms of our ability to do science in this domain, and the other half of me has like a a vague sense that this is like going to undermine something very bad. Uh -huh. and, uh, Okay. I guess I, I was curious if you could talk about that. Right. Can I come back to that? Because we're going to talk about something where it, you're going to get that feeling tenfold Great. in about five minutes. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and then we'll you're on to something really right. exciting. And right. The, I had a more concrete question, which is 
how about, I was thinking about what things would rank high or low on this, mm -hmm. and I was wondering about something like sitting by a lake. <laughs> right, right, right. So how do things that are, right. Yeah, and we haven't, I mean, we obviously haven't tested sitting by a lake, but I think what you're getting at is that the creative process is not necessarily just about using a tool, right? That creativity happens, you know, for me it's in the shower, right? Um, and, and this is not, I mean, I guess I could, I could give people this creativity support index for different showers and see, you know, which one is most supportive of creativity, but I think you're getting at this point that this is a, a big complex process. These types of tools are probably not going to get at the whole process. They're probably going to get at parts of the process. So. Or, I mean, even if you just added intermediate variables like the setting that you're using the tool sure. in, you know, right. you factory can evaluation the night before a deadline sure. has a different feeling than to messing around right. in an open ended way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so. We're going to come back and talk about that. So the, the, the last thing I want to say about the Creativity Support Index is that if you ignore people's slider ratings of any particular tool and just pay attention to those pairwise rankings of which factors they consider to be most important to them while they're doing a given task, just that alone gives you some really interesting information. So these are two completely different studies. This was about slideshow creation, the Ken Burns effect. This one was about color vector drawing and color exploration. This study was run with novice users. This study was run with experts. They were architects and designers. Um, and what you can see is if you look at the red, the, the pie, this is the effort reward trade-off, how much work they had to put in to, to get the result they got. And the experts could care less, right? They, they, it's their job. They have to put in effort. So that becomes less important. The novices were like, yeah, if I have to put in a lot of effort and I don't get much out of it, then you know, I don't want to do this. So you start to see different types of things becoming relevant in different tasks and across different populations. Um, now, of course, you don't want to put a whole lot of um, you know, stock in these numbers. You'd want to run them again and, and verify them, but they at least give you a starting point and some interesting information. So the other thing, and I thought Scott was going to get at this, about the CSI is that it's a survey. And it's subject to all of the issues of self-report, recall, um, you know, good investigator bias in the research world, um, or sorry, good subject bias, all those types of things. right? And so I think it's valuable, but I consider it to be one tool in what I hope will be you know, a big toolkit with lots of different ways to evaluate creativity. So the, the second big approach that I'm taking here is to say, well, what about physiological sensing? We're getting more and more sensors that people can wear. They're cheap off-the-shelf solutions, so they're easy for someone like me who's not an engineer. Um, and they give you pretty decent data. Um, and what's really interesting is that you can sort of think about them as more honest right, than people's reports in a survey. Um, so we started looking at physiological sensing of creativity states. Now, our first foray into this world is a little different than s actually sensing creative work or action. Because of the Dance Draw Project, I have access to performances and audiences. So we started looking initially at people's physiological responses to a creative output. So this is from the audience's perspective. If you wire up an audience with GSR sensors, which are galvanic skin response, they are sweat gland activation, so they're supposed to be about your arousal, can you find out something about that performance? Um, and is that, is that data actually meaningful? Would the performing arts experts care? Would they make any sense of the data, or would they not want it? So, to start this off, we ran this exploratory study with seven performing arts experts, choreographers and directors. And we gave them this little custom video player that had a performance in it. And it had these lines here, which were uh, GSR lines from people watching the video or people watching the performance. So we had four participants, and we got their, their uh, arousal. There was a button where you could aggregate it. So you could see a single line that was sort of the average arousal, or you could look at the individual data lines. And the other tool that we gave the experts was the ability to put in these blue lines, which allowed them to chunk the data in ways that were meaningful to them. 
So a choreographer might come in and say, well, there's this little short section in here where there's a whole lot of leaps that is supposed to sort of, you know, really grab people's attention. So I want to see what's happening in there. And the pink level between these bars is actually the aggregate um, arousal of the audience members. So we just gave this to them to see, would they make sense of it? Did they care? That kind of thing. And what we found was that they were very interested in the data. Yep. Curves were GSR data? Yes, yes. Okay. They, were, they were told what that was and, and how that was collected and, and so on. Um, so we were a little bit afraid that they would adopt what we call a stimulus response um, sort of interpretation of this data. They'd say, oh, well, I just want to make sure that I get 100% engagement or arousal all the time. Or can I see that when this happened, I get a jump in arousal because that's what I want to see. Um, and they were a lot more cautious and nuanced in their interpretation of the data. They were really interested in looking at the differences between the individual lines and how they varied versus the, the aggregate line. They wanted to know about sort of demographics. They wanted to look at the arc of the lines over time, not you know specific times in response to something. So we liked the way they generally approached the data. Um, we also asked them, because GSR data will go up or down depending on your arousal. And your arousal could be because you're angry and it could go up. Or it could be because you're happy and excited and it could go up. So there's no valence data in your sweat glands, right? Um, and we said, well, if we could give you valence data somehow, would you want it? And they all said no. And the reason why is they said, if I know, if, if I hear that somebody hates something or they really love it, eh, doesn't really matter to me because unless I know why, who cares? Right? It could be because it reminds them of their mother, or they hate it because it reminds them of an ex-boyfriend. And you know, that's irrelevant to my art. So um, they, they said they didn't care about that. Now, there was one participant in this set of seven experts who, and I think this is what Scott was getting at earlier, he hated this. He said, I want you to stop this research right now. Um, he said, this is like the eugenics of biology. You are going to kill art, right? Because he really saw the stimulus response approach. And he said, this is going to make people try to get engagement to be 100% all the time. And it's going to lead to art that is mass market, mediocre, blah. Um, and so he's got a great valid point. And, and I knew that potential going in. My, my reason for going ahead with this anyways is that Hollywood is doing this. Right? They do this with the you know, political elections during commercials and things like that. Um, I feel like we should give these tools to the artists so they can use them to subvert those influences. Um, but it's interesting that there was that uh, approach to it. So one of our choreographers actually said this. She said, you know, when you talk to people, they're only able to say what they like. It's very co concentrated to what they're cognizant of. And she liked that this is an organic response that's subconscious. So she herself was getting at, this is somehow an honest response. You know, that you can't fake your GSR. And, and she really thought that was um, very interesting and exciting. So we basically, other than the one person, we pretty much got the go ahead that this was really interesting. They, they'd like to see this data. So then we had to say, well, we better make sure this data is actually meaningful. Right? Because you could hook an entire audience up and get GSR readings from everybody. But maybe that doesn't actually reflect the way people are consciously reacting to a performance. Um, so we wanted to check and see if it did. So we did this very controlled lab study with 49 participants where we'd bring them into a dark room, put them in front of a projector screen, give them headphones. We project a video performance. We connected them to GSR with their non-dominant hand. And in their dominant hand, we gave them a slider where they had to say how engaged they were with the performance as they watched it. Um, so we were hoping to see correlations. Now, in piloting this, we ran into a, a problem. Right? If I asked you to say how engaged you are right at the second, can you say that? Right? Do you know what it means to be engaged? Yeah, you guys are you know, grad students, professors. You probably have some idea. But the average person was like, I don't know what you mean by engaged. Um, so we had to come up with some other vocabulary. And so our initial thought was to come up with this vocabulary of no emotional response to strong emotional response. 
And in piloting that, people understood what we meant. So they weren't confused about it. I still felt that giving people the scale to manipulate second by second was not going to be very good because there's a lot of cognitive overload in having to think, how strong is my emotional response right now, and actually report that. Um, so we came up with this other vocabulary, which is very straightforward, love it, hate it. Um, that's actually a little testy to do for dance. The dancers don't want me to use this, right? Because they, it makes them feel like they're on American Idol or something. Um, but for the purposes of the study, to make sure that there was some correlation between engagement and reaction, we tried it out. And so this one obviously has kind of a neutral in the middle, whereas this one, your sort of no emotional response is at the bottom, which means that we assumed a mapping along these lines, that those types of ratings would be similar to the whole ratings over here, and that the bottom ratings, if you took the absolute value, would be similar, right? So a really strong, I hate it, would be like a strong emotional response. Um, so we had these two hypotheses that both of these would actually be correlated with, you know, your sweat gland arousal. And um, we got decent results. The emotional response one was correlated, not really, really strongly, but it was correlated. The love-hate scale was strongly correlated. Um, so this is interesting because the love-hate scale was easier for people to use. They reported it being easier to use. And it also gives us valence, which if you remember is what our experts said they didn't want. But we did have one expert who did say to us, you know, if you gave me the valence data, I'd look at it. It'd be like a guilty pleasure, like Facebook, but I'd look at it, <laughs> right? So, you know, if we could give it to them, they, they might actually be interested in. Do you do an absolute value on the love it hated? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. So you so you take them you fold it over the midpoint, take the absolute right. value, and then that correlation. That's right. Got yeah. it. Yeah. Hey, I mean, I guess one question I have is because you mentioned cognitive load. It seems the best measure of engagement is you forget to mess with the slide. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually we've been sort of thinking about that because we've got some ongoing studies where we need to to look at this and that just actually when people snap back in and move it again those points might give you some interesting data too. So um, it, is, it is tricky though. And I would have to say, I, knowing that this love-hates vocabulary works well is nice if you need to run studies along these lines. I wouldn't actually ever recommend you giving audience members sliders to manipulate during a performance. It's terrible. I, was, I mean, I served as a participant in one of these things in one of our pilot studies and sat there through a whole theater performance trying to move this slider. And, it just it ruined the whole experience for me. It really did. I, I hated having to concentrate on that and focus on that. So, but for the purpose of this study, we found out that your sweat gland arousal is correlated with how engaged you are with the performance. So that's good. Yeah. I think that's totally different from, from the audience hissing and clapping. <laughs> well, I think the audience hissing and clapping is not, I mean, it's not constant. Right? When we're using these sliders, it's second by second that we're expecting people to be changing it. So hissing and clapping comes to, ca to happen at you know, breaks in the flow of the performance. Right. Well, and somebody has done a clap, a clap meter, right? There's, there's a, you know, a piece of work and tie on that. So, but again, it's, it only gives you sort of these sporadic inputs. Two quick questions. The first relates to Stu's comment. Um, were people watching this by themselves? So in this study, yes, yes, it was it was one person. Because clapping and booing and hissing is not it's just a, a personal it's, it's response, a it's a social experience. response. Yes, so that's, that's right. Yeah. And the other one, this is just pure curiosity, but I have to ask, uh, were love and hate balanced, or did you see different valences, either across the population or across individuals? Because that just seems kind of interesting. I don't remember. I actually don't remember. Um, I have to go back and look at the data to see. This is a while ago now, so. Did you check whether using this slider changes your memory of the event? In some ways, I think that having to reflect on what you see will change may, your experience. Will, will, in a number of ways, change your memory of the event. Right. Um, no, we didn't check on that, but I would just assume that yes, it would. How it would is a different question. I, it's hard to imagine how you would figure that out, but yeah, um, hard to do an A-B test on that. Um, Okay, so that was measuring an audience's response to a creative output. What, where we're really trying to go is figure out 
what your physiological state is while you're engaged in doing something creative, like creating a dance, or creating a theater piece, or creating a painting, or, or what have you. And so we're looking at using sensors, and, and we've done one study, which I'll talk about on this. The overall approach is this. I want to, first of all, come up with ways for people to temporarily self-report when they feel that they are being especially creative. So coming up with a tool to allow them to do that is a challenge in itself, because you, you can't ask them to do it while they're engaged in the activity, because that would break the flow. So you kind of have to do it retrospectively, and then you've got recall issues. and So it's, it's not an easy um, problem in, in itself. And then we want to, if we can get those periods when someone says, I was being creative here and here and here, use those as labels to physiological data, like EEG um, or GSR or some others. Um, I want to treat those, black, th those physiological signals as black box data. And this is kind of critical, because you may be aware that there's a lot of neuroscience research on different areas of activation in the brain, depending on different types of tasks. And you may have heard that alpha wave activation is high during creative work and things along those lines. So you might think, well, shouldn't you just rely on all that research, right? But a lot of that research is contradictory. Um, a lot of that research starts on this assumption that, oh, look, this is the creative brain. Like, you know, this is your brain on drugs. This is the creative brain right here. And we know that because we got people who are known to be creative and we got brain images of them. Well, but they, they weren't necessarily being creative right then, you know. So a lot of that research is really um, iffy at this point. It's just not far enough along. So our approach is let's take these signals that we can get from whatever sensors we have and just treat it as raw data, not worry about whether it's from the frontal cortex or, or what have you. Um, and then the hope is that we could develop what I call a biometric creativity signature, right? And it's highly probable that my biometric creativity signature is going to be different than your biometric creativity signature. But we don't know yet. So we did a study on this. Um, how am I doing for time? You have till two. I have till two, but is that clock actually correct? OK, <laughs> good. Um, so we did this study on this, um, and we brought people in, and we asked them to sketch for half an hour. They used the Sketchbook Express tool. We had them wear an EEG headset, the Epic headset. And after they had sketched for half an hour while wearing the headset, they were then asked to go back and watch the screen recorded video of themselves sketching. It also had audio in case they'd said anything. There was that, that was also there. And they were asked to actually specify time periods when they felt they were especially creative. So they'd be watching the video, they're here, they press a key, and they get a start segment. And then they press a key again somewhere here, and they say, OK, my creativity's changing. And then for that segment that they specified, they can raise and lower a level to say, you know, I was, I was sort of creative, or I think I was really creative, et cetera. All right, so this gives us that labeled data. Um, and then, of course, we have the EEG. Now, what we also did then was we gave the same interface to external judges. Right? So we have when, what the person thinks when they were being creative. And we gave it to three art experts and asked them to watch the video of this person sketching and say when they thought this person was being creative. So we have um, a triangulation. Now, before I get into talking about the results, you probably have a lot of questions about this. right? Is this in the moment creativity, this, this what we're defining as these temporal periods of creative experience, is this really creativity? Right? And, and the answer is, honestly, I don't know. We don't know what creativity is. It doesn't have a specific standardized definition. So for our purposes, we define it as temporal periods when someone reports they're having what they consider to be a creative experience. And we expect that over time, that person's definition would be steady. But that person's definition may be slightly different than someone else's definition. All right. Um, it's also important to note, and we talked about this earlier, that this is getting one part of the creative process. Right? Typically, especially in this study, it's getting kind of the execution phase. Right? And we recruited people. We said, this is a sketching study. If you like to sketch, come and be a participant. We'll pay you a small incentive. So we got people who were artistically inclined and liked to sketch. Um, and we told them ahead of time. You can bring an idea of what you'd like to sketch. 
Right? We didn't want to constrain them and say, you all have to sketch this same one thing. Um, and so their creative moment could have been, I mean, their big creative moment, their moment of inspiration could have been two weeks earlier in the shower. Right? Um, and then they come in and they're executing. And we think that there is some creativity in that execution phase, and we're trying to get those periods. Now, we're not getting that entire process. We're also not getting the reflections on that creativity that might happen a week later or a month later. But given that our goal is to improve these creativity support tools and understand how to make them better, concentrating on this execution phase makes sense at this point. Okay. So we have this triangulation approach. We've got this physiological measurement, the EEG data from 16, I believe, nodes on that headset. We have these external judgments from these art experts, and we have these uh, self-report writings. Now, the external judgments are not, this is a nice drawing. They were temporal periods of, I think this person was being creative here and here. Um, you can see right away that that process is going to be different. Right, the person reporting on their creativity, they can remember what was going on in their head when they're doing that. And the external judges don't have that information. All they have is this video that they're watching. So we used um, interclass correlation coefficients, ICCs, to study how correlated these things were. Um, so what was interesting is that the three judges between them actually quite reliable in terms of the correlation, the consistency between the segments they identified, which was really promising. Um, the correlation between the external judges and the participant self-report, less strong. And you know, we kind of expect that, given that the participant could remember what they were thinking. So they might identify periods when they were thinking as being creative. There might have been nothing going on on the screen recording at that time. So the judges might not have identified that as a creative period. So there's some, there's some correlation, but it's not strong. Um, so this is kind of a picture of what we got, and we used really simple machine learning. I'm no <coughs> machine learning expert. We just uh, used tenfold cross-validation um, to look at this stuff, and we generated two classifiers for each participant. One classifier was from the judges' time periods, and one classifier was from their self-report time periods. For the self-report, we got a classifier accuracy of 75%. Um, so I was pretty happy with this. This, this was a, a pretty good result. What's interesting is that using the external judges' time segments, we got a classifier accuracy of 85%. So that's, um, that, that's quite impressive. Now, what I actually think is possibly going on here is that this is actually activity, right? I think that activity is probably a pretty decent proxy for creativity in the execution phase, but not an exact proxy. So the thing about this is that getting these judges to do this, it's time consuming for them, and it's expensive. So this result, just using a one person self-report, is actually pretty satisfying on its own. Um, OK, so there's a whole lot of different directions that we need to sort of take this work forward to investigate. Yep. Uh, how did you uh, decide when the classifier got something wrong versus right? Was it predicting the time period when? So um, the, the self-reported data was split into if the creativity rating was anywhere above sort of the third mark, then that was a creative period. Anything below that was a non-creative period. And so then the classifier was basically looking at the periods that were considered creative and looking at the EEG data during those periods, you know, munged on a bunch of data for learning and then judged and then ran on the data on the other EEG and we tested against the self-report periods to see if it was correct. When you say activity, you mean literally like how many strokes at what speed? Or what sure, like action, so yeah. And so... And you had that data also. Well, we, we had that data. We didn't actually capture keyboard and mouse data, which we should have. They were using a, a Wacom tablet. But um, that's sort of an obvious next step, is to, is to look at that. Because if activity is indeed a good proxy for creativity in the execution phase, then doing all this EEG stuff is really, you know, in some sense, kind of you know, 
useless. We don't need to do it. It's, it's way more work than we need to do. So that's something that we're expecting to look at. Um, during this study, actually, our participants also wore the ICOM, the Activia Q sensor, which is a GSR sensor with an accelerometer built in. And we did that specifically, and we had it on their dominant hand. We did that specifically because we thought, well, this is great. We can use the accelerometer on their, on their dominant hand and filter by activity. Unfortunately, that sensor just it, it didn't report half in half of our participants. It was really unreliable. So we ended up just ignoring that data completely. Um, we have a new version of that. We're hoping we can do better next time and actually get that. But I mean, you can get lots of activity data just from keyboard, um, mouse input, that kind of thing. So, yeah. So given where you've ended up so far with this, how do you distinguish between being creative and being productive <laughs> in a you know, it's socially considered a creative task. Right. And I, does that difference matter? Right. I, that's, that's the thing. I mean, if, if you think about the, the, aim, the end goal here is imagine we know your creativity signature, right? And you sit down in front of Photoshop, and we're measuring you, and we can say, wow, look, Jeff is being really creative right now. Which particular tools in Photoshop is he using? And then all of a sudden, your creativity just tanks. Whoa, what, what did you just do? You know, did, did you get interrupted by your email or was it, you know, you were using the curves tool in Photoshop and you should have been using my curves tool instead, right? Like, you know, that's the kind of thing we want to be able to see in the task that's supporting the digital actions, what helps you stay in the creative mode longer, what causes you to leave it so that we can adjust it, right? Um, so, so I don't think that actually that distinction necessarily matters for the goal that I have anyways. Um, it may be that it matters if you want to take this biometric creativity signature and apply it to other purposes. Then maybe if it really is productivity, then maybe it doesn't work. But we don't really know at this point. So, so at this point, we have done this diagonal, right? We've taken one person's data and used it to build a classifier for themselves and tested it. Right? I don't know if using a classifier built on my data, if you know, it would work on Terry. Or if we could take and build a, a combined classifier using you know, all four of our data and, and have that be something that's actually accurate for a general population of, of, of people. My guess is that this is going to be highly dependent on task and expertise. Right? So if you get a bunch of expert Photoshop users Maybe when they're in there doing their stuff, they might have a similar biometric creativity signature. Maybe not even given how wide and varied Photoshop is. It might have to be a particular persona of Photoshop users, the people who are you know, actually editing photos for fashion magazines. Right? It's, it's hard to know how specific this, these, these classifiers are going to have to be or if they'll generalize. Right? Um, maybe all. Photoshop use would be the same creativity biometric signature. But I'm kind of doubting it. I think skill level is going to have a lot to do with it. Um, domain is going to have a lot to do with it. I doubt that a creativity signature for somebody who's an expert piano composer is going to be really similar to somebody who is you know, a scientist using a visualization tool for you know, creative problem solving. Right? I doubt that those signatures are going to look the same because we know there's a lot of different brain activation going on um, across those. So we have to sort of, this is wide open, right? We've got some good early initial results, but we need to push forward and see how general this can get. And that's what we're doing um, next. There's also an issue, so because I'm not a machine learning expert, we took this data and I gave it to a colleague of mine at UNC Charlotte who is a machine learning expert. And he actually gave it to his machine learning graduate class. He's like, here's your final project. Munge on this. It's a competition. right? And let's see if any of you can get better classifiers than what Celine and her student Aaron got. Um, and a few of them got something slightly better, but no, nothing really remarkable. So he came back to us. And after spending a lot of time with the data, he said, you know, what you're doing doesn't really require any specialized, you know, crazy machine learning. It's pretty straightforward. Really, the issue with this is how you collect your data. That's really going to determine what your results are like. And so we're looking back at how we collected data. And we had people specify time periods. One of the problems that caused us is that all those time periods where they said they were not creative is just zeroed out data. 
right? And that probably doesn't make sense. There was probably some level of creativity going on there. So in our next iteration, we'll be looking at collecting second by second um, creativity self-report rather than sort of time segments, chunks. Um, that's going to be harder for our participants to do. We're trying to figure out how do we get them to do this without you know, really annoying our participants. So that's, that's an open challenge. But um, we're, we're working on different tools. We're, we're looking at using a physical knob and breaking, watching the video up into sort of five or 10 minute chunks, going back and then doing more. Um, we just don't quite know the best way to do this. So we're thinking about that. So I think that is where I will stop. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes. I use it all the time. I think Scott's seen it before. Sorry, Scott. Um, but really, I think art is a rehearsal for the orientation which makes innovation possible. You could actually take rehearsal out. I think art is the orientation which makes innovation possible. Um, I know that working with artists and dancers and all these different folks has really helped me to push my boundaries in very different ways. So it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. And these are people that I work with, my great PhD students, and lots and lots of different collaborators. And I'll stop now and take questions. You all ask questions throughout, so it's OK if you don't have any more. Mm -hmm. um, I just have a question about the test accuracy that you reported. So the test set is uh, I was on uh, all the self-reported chemicals when the participant thinks that they're being. Well, it wasn't that the it was the the self-report was the test set, and the judge the judges' intervals was the um, you know what we then worked on for the participant self-report. We use some portion of their data to build the classifier and the rest of their data to test it. And then we did the same thing with the judge's data. We used some small portion of it, um, you know, the, the tenfold uh, cross-validation. It just takes pieces from the whole data set, uses that to build a classifier, and then the rest of the data set is used to test it. So you're still testing on the top Yes, yes. So if you build a classifier that returns true all the time, that will get like 100% well, no, because not all, the, not all the EEG signals are going to match, you know, what, the, what it looked like during that test data. So, but I think that we do, have, we do have a problem in that we don't have sort of a, you know, that, the, the, the inverse test set. We may be over-specifying our data. And that's one of the reasons that we're moving to this different um, method in our next studies of collecting complete um, data and then we'll be segmenting it differently and and hopefully getting you know even better classifiers but we'll see yeah back were any of your dancers and choreographers interested in using your multi hand mouse thing to um, make up dances to notate dances oh, okay um so the dancers are typically undergrad students, um, so they were, they're not interested in notating dances particularly. Um, but they did enjoy playing with the devices. Um, and different devices that we've used, we've used little wireless accelerometers and then the camera tracking. They're always wanting to play with it and understand the coupling and, and see how, how well it controls and so on. But in terms of doing things like um, creating choreo choreography online. I mean, there's an entire history of that. There's a life form software, body f which became body form software, where you have little, little avatars on your screen, and you can position them, and you can create choreographic phrases, and so on. Um, it's funny that that's never really gone very far. It's never really taken off in a big way. Uh, I've tried the software. It's not particularly easy to use. If you think about taking a 3D avatar and trying to pose it in the you know, million different ways that a dancer can shape their body, it's extremely time consuming to do that with a mouse with a little avatar on screen. So, and, and yes, it could probably be a little bit easier with two mice. You could get things a little bit more expressive. But I still think, compared to just telling a dancer, go like this. Right, the dancer goes like that, and you know it's immediate. So, I think there's a there's a a real difference in that interaction, and that's why that's never really.
taken off. Um, one of the things I will say that's sort of related that, to that, though, is there's a timeliness to this intervention with technology in dance. Um, if we had tried to create the choreographer's notebook 15 years ago, right, if the technology had allowed it, it would probably not take off. Um, dancers uh, and choreographers as a population like to live a very embodied life, right? They like to be very physically active. They don't like sitting at computers typically. Now, in our current society, they're doing it anyways, right? They're all doing their banking online and they're on Facebook and they're using Gmail because everybody else is. So they're now at a point where computers are a regular part of their lives. And so we've had comments uh, from dancers using the choreographer's notebook saying, well, you know, this is great because I get up and I'm in my pajamas with my coffee and I got my Facebook and my Gmail and my choreographer's notebook. It's just another tab in their browser, right? So it works now and it probably wouldn't have 10 or 15 years ago. So in a similar vein, it could be that choreographers might now be more willing to do some of this posing of figures to create choreography in a digital way. But I still think that's a bigger leap. A very simple device question. You talked about two-handed input. Yeah. And of course, what's happened now is with touch screens, mm -hmm. in some sense you have two-handed, although so many of the touch screens you use, you're using one hand to hold it. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you've got tilt. You've got it. It's a, so how could you take advantage of that sort of extra technological affordance that, that those things give where you can right. do more, so you have accelerometers and all that? I was at um, Adobe yesterday, and Mira Doncheva there um, was showing me some stuff that they're working on where they're using an iPad as an input device to Photoshop. So you've got Photoshop on your main computer, and it's open, and you're doing some stuff, and you have your controls for what tools you're using on your iPad, and it's just it's linked up. Um, now, what they've got right now is very simple. Like, I choose the brush tool, or I, you know, I choose a selection tool, and I'm doing it here, and then it's, it's updating over there. But given that the iPad actually offers multi-touch interaction, you could imagine more expressive techniques where you can use your different fingers. Now, in terms of tilt, I mean, tilt's, tilt's a single continuous variable, right? It's not, it's not an X and Y the way a mouse is, right? I mean, oh yeah, yeah. well, do, but do they, do they, they do, yeah, they do, yeah. So actually there is, yeah. Um, I wonder if you could use tilt as like just a, another spatial input string. It feels like something a dancer would be much more comfortable with. Right, right. It's possible. I don't know that that's a particularly good form for sort of a spatial input string. I mean, the types of techniques that I'm interested in are really actually about having a second cursor that gives you that second spatial input stream. So I don't think that tilt on an iPad would do that. But it, it certainly could do some things, um, you know. You could imagine tilting an iPad and maybe that affecting a curve. So yeah, I think, I think there's definitely possibilities. To me, the most exciting thing about everybody having iPads and iPhones and all these two-handed devices is that consumers are now getting demanding in a way that they haven't been for a long time, right? Consumers, you know, they'd never say, well, I want a second mouse and a second cursor because it just didn't occur to them. But now it's starting to occur to them because they're like, well, I can use two hands on here why can't I use two hands when I'm at my laptop, right? So I think that's really great because it's going to force, um, you know, the major operating system companies to, to update their systems and allow this. Uh, Windows 7 was supposed to actually allow multiple spatial input streams from different devices, and it got cut at the last minute. So even though Windows 7 actually handles multi-touch, if you've got a, the, the right kind of display, plug in two mice, they still fight over one cursor. So. Maybe Windows 8. But I'm a Mac user, so. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering, could you explain a little more about the reasoning behind explicitly telling the sketching participants beforehand that they could come up with an idea? Yeah, that's, that's kind of a tough one. So there's some research in the creativity literature that talks about constraints being a creative prompt, right? If you constrain people, then you know they get really creative within those constraints kind of thing. So some literature would suggest that we should have brought people in and said, you need to sketch a horse or whatever it may be. Um, but there's other literature that conflicts that, that says when you constrain people, you know, people are not 
going to be as creative. So, and I think it's very sort of situationally dependent. So one of the issues that we have in the study we ran was that the stakes were low, right? Um, the participants came in, they were getting paid 10 or 15 bucks. Um, they could sketch something. If they were super creative, they were, but if they weren't, it was no big deal, right? And that's not necessarily reflective of the way creative people work in the real world. You know, there's lots of creative people who work towards hard deadlines, right? Designers and, and, and so on. Um, so I can imagine that their approach to creativity under those constraints is actually, you know, they get really creative because they have to. Um, but it's hard to artificially create the right kind of constraints. I think if you try to artificially create those constraints, it could really easily backfire. So we're hoping um, to try to increase the stakes a little bit. Um, we're running a, a study right now on Mechanical Turk that's a collaborative creative writing study. And we're trying to increase the stakes there. This is a study that's designed to test to do the last testing on our Creativity Support Index survey to test the collaboration statements, because they haven't been well tested yet. Everything else is, is set. Um, so we're bringing in people on Mechanical Turk and bringing them into a Google Doc with another person, and they have to collaboratively write a story. And in order to increase the stakes, what we've said is that your story is going to be judged. You're going to get paid $10 or $5, but your story is going to be judged. If it's highly judged to be highly creative, you could get an extra $5. Um, to get that through IRB, we actually have to pay everybody the extra five dollars, um, which means that we're actually deceiving people. So then we had to go back and re but it, um, yeah, IRB is always fun. But um, I think that constraints and stakes are interrelated, and um, it's another it's another challenge in this kind of research. Any other questions? Oh, thank you, thank you. Yes, absolutely. Let's see what we sound like, what we look like. That's us. And then the obvious thing is. <laughs> I purposely do this to get lots of applause. Yes. That's right. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.